Well, good morning again. Good to see everybody. We're getting close to the end of our series as we've been studying the life of David and some of the things that the Lord taught David throughout the course of his life and many of the things that he's also passed on to us through David's life and through David's, David's example, things that, that ultimately served to, I think, strengthen our faith and, and point us to Jesus Christ. And this morning, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 2. And I, I titled this message, If I Could Only Tell You One More Thing Before I Die. And the reason I gave it that title, even though I think that sounds a little bit cryptic, is uh, the fact that this is a portion of Scripture that gives us the actual things that David said to Solomon right before he passed away. So if you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 primarily this morning, and then we're going to look at some uh, companion verses as well. 1 Kings chapter 2, this is what it says, starting with verse 1. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in His ways and keeping His statutes, His commandments, His rules and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish His word that He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul. You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at your word together this morning. And we pray that as we look at this portion of Scripture, and it gives us an account of the, the various things that you inspired David to share with Solomon and, and likewise inspired that these things be written down so that they would be shared with us. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from them. We pray that we would grow in our walk with you. We pray that we would understand the, the importance of passing along good counsel and, and, uh, and certainly encouraging the generations that come after us to, to live a life that puts you first and honors you. But Lord, we're grateful when we look at this portion of Scripture, you use this and all portions of Scripture to point us to your Son, Jesus Christ. So we pray that we would, we would see your Son in the midst of what we're looking at together today. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to look at this portion of your Word. We love you. We thank you for this all. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was recently watching a video that was part of a series of videos that were actually put together by a hospice nurse. And I imagine that for most people, her job would seem like a very dreaded task. But it's her responsibility to each day help uh, and, and comfort people who are basically in the last stages of life. Now, admittedly, that's a unique calling. And uh, that's something that I think most of us would agree would require an added measure of mercy, an added measure, measure of compassion, added measure of love, and as she was speaking, she mentioned that she learned a lot about death during the course of her years of serving people in her present capacity. And she also said that much of what she's learned has caused her not to fear death the way she once did. She said sitting with people in the midst of these moments has helped strengthen her faith because she could actually see the hand of God at work, even in how He's designed our physical bodies to shut down. That's something she's noticed. She could see his, his hand at work in the lives of the people that she's serving. She also said that for most of her patients, their final moments have transpired rather peacefully, and as far as she could tell, without significant pain. Uh, many of them could tell, based on some of the changes that were happening in their bodies, that their time of death was coming soon. And as she was describing this, and as she was talking about this, hearing her description as she was sharing these things, it actually reminded me a lot of some of the things that, that the evangelist Dwight Moody said to his son during his final moments. I don't know if you're familiar with this account or familiar with these words, but I'll, I'll share it with you. I actually think it's rather interesting. Uh, Moody, by the way, during the course of his evangelistic ministry in the second half of the 1800s, he had famously said that someday folks would read about his death in the newspaper, 
but he encouraged them, hey, don't, don't believe it. When you, when you read my death in the newspaper, don't believe it, because he said, you know, those born in the Spirit would be very much alive with Christ in heaven for all eternity. And at the end of his life with his family at his bedside, Moody said out loud, he said, earth recedes and heaven opens before me. And then his son, Will, who was right by his father's bedside, who assumed his father was dreaming as he, as he said these things, you know, just tried to comfort and, and assure Moody, and, and Moody assured him that he was not dreaming. He said, no, this is not a dream, Will. He said, it's beautiful. It's like a trance. If this is death, it's sweet. There's no valley here. God is calling me, and I must go. And then he died just a, a, a brief time after saying those words. That was on December 26th, 1899. Now, I have often wondered if the Lord will give me the opportunity to formally say goodbye to my family with, uh, and like offer words of wisdom and things like that when, when my day comes, or if my transition to heaven is going to be something that happens in a sudden and unexpected way, and maybe my final words will just be, ah, or something like that. I don't know if that's going to be the case. In my mind, it's all very poetic, uh, but the way these things often work out is not really the way we have planned. And I guess in many respects, I'm glad I don't know how it's all going to work out. But <laughs> when I look at 1 Kings chapter 2 here, and I see the things that, that, that David said and the things that were going on here, you would actually see that David was very conscious of the fact that his final days were at hand. This was on his mind, and he's thinking, all right, how do I steward this season of my life? How do I steward this final chapter? And so in view of the promises that God had made him during the course of his life, and in view of the fact that the responsibility to now lead the people of Israel was now going to be falling upon his son Solomon, who by the way, was somewhere around 20 years old at the time. I've seen people say he might have been 19. Anyone 19? You want to lead a nation, age 19? Uh, he might have been 20. Some people say he might have been even as old as 21. Um, but he thought about all of this, and, and he thought, I need to talk to Solomon. I need to share some things with Solomon. I need to use this time to help prepare Solomon. And so you have David in his, essentially in his, his final chapter here, he shared some final counsel with Solomon. And as you look at the things that he says here in this passage, I think it's counsel that we would really all do well to keep in mind because it's something that, that gives us good advice on how to conduct ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives and also how to steward the responsibilities that the Lord entrusts to us. And there's a variety of things here that you could see that, that as David is saying these things, he's trying to do a couple things. He's trying to pass along wisdom. He's trying to point his son to the Lord, and he's also trying to give his son a pep talk because he knows how hard the job Solomon's about to take on will actually be. And he's trying to do all those things. And so I think it's very interesting when I see people in moments like that who aren't thinking about themselves as much as they're thinking about somebody else. And he was certainly thinking about Solomon in these moments. And we read um, verses 1 through 4 of 1 Kings chapter 2 just a moment ago, so you probably notice and can probably just, you know, think about for a second some of the things that, that David said here to Solomon. But one of the first things that he tells him in this context and in this conversation, he conveys this thought of, Solomon, be strong and show yourself a man. That's what he says, be strong and show yourself a man. Now, I have to tell you, I'm grateful for the men that the Lord's placed in my life who aren't afraid to carry themselves like men. They keep their word. They look you in the eye. They honor and respect women. They work hard. They know how to actually shake your hand. You ever meet somebody who you shake their hand, you're like, all right, that was gross. That was gross. There's somebody, I, I won't tell you who, but there's somebody, and I haven't seen him in years, but I used to dread having to, to shake his hand he was another pastor. I'm just going to admit that to you. Now you're like, ooh, who is it? I'm not going to say. But every time he would, <laughs> every time he would shake your hand, it was like he just handed you like half a pound of lunch meat. You know what I mean? It's like, here. It was like, it was just like, I'm like, do you like, you know, you got to reach in. And like, so in the back here, all right, I'm just saying, never fear, like just going for it. All right. Like shake hands, right? 
I'll let you determine how, how, how much of a grip we, we share, all right? But I remember just thinking at one point, I was like, that's gross. I'm just going to like pat that guy on the back. I don't ever want to shake his hand. It's just like, felt like, like, here you go, like nothing. But something else I know about, about people that I'm grateful for in my life that, that I think aren't afraid to carry themselves like men, they put Jesus first. That's an example that I, that I, I truly, truly appreciate from some of the examples that that the Lord's placed in my life. I'm grateful to be surrounded by friends and family and mentors that exhibits these traits or that exhibit these traits because here's the thing, we live in an era of weak men who struggle to understand what being a man actually means. And I'm not just talking about puffing up your chest and trying to be macho and trying to lift heavy things in front of your wife or your girlfriend, right? It's not what I'm talking about. And and here's the thing, I think the struggle actually gets perpetuated by some men who actually spend their lives living like toddlers who only choose to do what feels good, but can't be bothered to keep their commitments or care for their households or raise their own children or even make the smallest sacrifices for the good of the nation and the culture that God has placed them in. And I look at that and I think, interesting days we live in. And so here you look at David. And he's looking at his son Solomon, and his eyes are weak, and he's at the end of his life and at the end of his reign, and he encourages young Solomon here to be strong in the strength that the Lord supplied him, and to demonstrate that he actually knows what it means to be a man of God. So what he's encouraging his son to keep in mind is he's as he's using some of his final words here in this conversation, this is what he's encouraging his son to understand. Now, here's the thing. Solomon wasn't the kind of guy that would have the opportunity to spend his 20s like some of the, the guys you know, in our generation get to spend their 20s. He wasn't going to be a, a guy you know, just sitting around playing video games and, and eating his parents' food and living rent-free in the same room that he used to wet the bed in when he was three years old, right? He was about to lead a nation... He was about to carry on his father's legacy as king over Israel. He was about 20 years old, so he didn't have the liberty to just sit around and goof off. He had an important task that was being entrusted to him. And David, as he looked at his son, he thought, you know what? I mean, the only way you could truly know the burdens of this job is to actually do it. And he's like, Solomon, be strong. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. Something else he encouraged him to to keep in mind was this. He told him to keep the charge of the Lord your God. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. Now, here's the thing about your life and my life as as we live in the era that we live in. It is not an accident that we live where we live and when we live. That is not accidental. We were born in this era of history according to God's design. And He entrusts to us various responsibilities that we're called to steward during the course of our adult lives. That's something that He entrusts to us. Now, I don't know all the responsibilities that the Lord will specifically entrust to you. We will each have different responsibilities, and sometimes our responsibilities will overlap and complement each other. But here's the thing. I'm sure whatever those responsibilities are for your life, that the Lord will eventually make those things clear to you. He'll make those things clear. I have to say, again, I've been blessed by the examples of adults that I could look to and say, all right, they, when their responsibilities were entrusted to them, they did not run from the responsibilities that the Lord had given them. And those are people that I I keep in mind because I find them inspiring, because I've also watched and witnessed those who do run from their calling. And when you see that, that's not very inspiring to see. So whatever responsibilities the Lord entrusts to your care, own that respect that, serve in it, because admittedly, there are going to be times when you will not feel like doing what God has asked you to do. Do you believe me when I say that? There are times you will not feel like doing what God asks you to do. I will confess to you, I have had those moments. I don't always feel like doing what God asks me to do, even when I know very clearly He said, no, I want you to do this. Sometimes I'm like, I don't feel like it, because that sounds hard, right? Or I don't feel like it because I'm tired from the last thing you asked me to do. And I'm guessing David probably felt that way as well. You know, I mean, everybody thinks it'd be so great to be king. I actually think that in some respects, there are probably days when David was like, I don't know that I want to be king today. Maybe I'll want to be king again tomorrow, but today it's not really fun, right? 
And I think he was probably anticipating that there were going to be days like that for Solomon. You're saying, like, Solomon, it's, this isn't going to be a bed of roses. This isn't going to be something that every single day you wake up and think, oh, it's just so easy to lead the people of Israel. Do you, do you remember the words that Moses said when he was leading the people of Israel as he was leading them from Egypt toward the promised land? There were different points in that experience when Moses was like, Lord, could you just literally take me today? Like, could today be my last day? I would actually be cool with that if today could be my last day. No? More decades of this. Great. No, this is great. This is, this is wonderful. Like, it's all going so well, right? He was like, do my job or be dead. No, I, I'd pick dead. I, I would, like, look at Moses' own words. He said that. And so David is encouraging Solomon. And you think you had a bad day at work this week, right? You look at David, what he's saying to Solomon. He's saying, he's saying look, keep the charge of the Lord your God. He knows that there's going to be days when, when Solomon would almost feel crushed by this burden of trying to lead the people of Israel. So he encouraged him, keep the charge that God has given you without shrinking from it on the hard days. Don't shrink from it on the days when it seems particularly tough. Then he goes on to give him additional counsel. And he challenges him to walk in God's ways and keep his statutes and commandments. Now, when my children were young, and those of you that um, are in the process of raising children or those of you that have adult children, I, I think you'll, you'll understand certainly where I'm coming from with this. Um, when my children were young, I felt an intense burden to help them know Jesus and understand the teaching of God's Word. That's something that was on my mind every day. It's still on my mind. Even though most of my children are adults at this point now, it's still on my mind every day. And so we would sit down and we would discuss the Scriptures. We would watch movies and programs that emphasized the teaching of God's Word. We'd listen to music that proclaimed the teaching of, of God's Word. We'd talk about it on a, a, a deeper level, particularly during car rides. That was one of my favorite things. You know, Deuteronomy 6 talks about this idea of instructing your children as you go, as you're walking, and I'm going to apply that also to long car rides. My kids used to joke after a while, they're like, you know what these rides turn into? It's like school. They're like, this is school. So they used to call it car school. If we had like if we had a drive that was going to be more than an hour in length, they're like, okay, here comes car school. And I was like, look, it's, you're trapped. Like, you can't go anywhere. You've got to listen to whatever your mother and I have to say. And the truth is, any parent, any Christian parent that loves their children, what do we want to do? We want to pass on the faith. We want to teach our children the gospel and what it looks like to live the Christian life. We want to help them understand all the teaching of God's Word so that they grow in it and so they apply it and so that they then pass it on to the generations that come after them. And as my kids got older, particularly in the young teenage years, um, I can tell you that my desire for them to walk in the Lord's ways continued and got expressed in brand new ways. And I remember at one point, I thought to myself, I was like, all right, the internet is useful and it's also filled with garbage. And I got to filter how this stuff comes into my house. And so I bought a system to try and filter it, and it can limit how much time the children were allowed to be online and, and could block a whole bunch of inappropriate content. And I remember at one point I had kind of set the filter rather sensitive on the time, like the time slot, because I, I really didn't want them sitting around on the internet all day. And so I was like, nah, not a lot of time. And they're like, hey, could you like add some more time to this? And I was like, no. And for a while, I was like, nope, I don't want you being on the internet all the time. Go outside and throw a football or ride your bike or do something like that or read a book. It's like, oh, read a book. That's a solution for everything. Read a book. And um, by the way, if you've never been grumbled against, have you really parented? Right? Wow. Right? And, um, and I, remember, <laughs> I remember at one point, I was like, all right, you know what? I think I'm being a little strict with how much time I'm, I'm giving them online. I could probably beef it up, but I want something in return. And so I said, all right, I'm going to make a deal with you guys. And I printed up these worksheets uh, that I'd be happy to share with anyone because I think I still have it saved on my computer if you want the file. But it basically listed the Ten Commandments and then gave them the opportunity to hand write those Ten Commandments underneath it. And for any copy of the Ten Commandments that I received that was handwritten, and it couldn't be photocopied or typed out so you could just print a file or anything like that. It had to be handwritten. Anytime you gave me a copy of the Ten Commandments handwritten, you got an extra hour online. And I thought to myself, maybe this will help. I don't know. They'll tell me someday if it helped or, or didn't. 
I'm sure I'll hear all sorts of stories. One of my kids recently told me, I can't wait to tell you all the things you don't know about us, Dad, someday, when we're past the statute of limitations. I'm like, what have you done? What have you done? I don't know. That literally, in the past month, was something that was brought up to me. I was like, I don't think I even want to know. I don't want to know. Um, But I mean, I think we can understand as parents what we want our children to grasp and, and be able to understand and hopefully pass along to the generations that come after them. And here you have David. He encouraged Solomon to be a man who walked with God. Now, that statement right there, walk with God, should that not be something that could be said of each of us? You know, if that could be said of each of us, that we walked with God, how wonderful would that be? You know, like... Like, who is James? He was a guy who walked with God. You know, who's Bobby Joe? A woman who walked with God. And here you have David encouraging Solomon to be a man who walks with God and keeps his commandments. Walks with God and keeps his commandments. Now, admittedly, Solomon did not do this perfectly. Now, have any of us made it through life mistake-free? Is there anyone in our midst who's made it through life mistake-free? Okay, so... Let's not be overly critical of Solomon because there's plenty to criticize, just like there's plenty to criticize in David's life, and just like there's plenty to criticize in our lives as well. We don't make it through life mistake-free, but here's the thing. Let's let the pattern of our life be that we're men and women who walk with God and keep His commandments. And I do appreciate what's told to us in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3. When you look at verse 3 of uh, 1 Kings 3, let me bring that up here for us. Because it tells us, this is in the following chapter from where we just read, but there it says this of Solomon. It says, Solomon loved the Lord. Not a beautiful statement. Solomon loved, it says, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Now, it also qualifies this to a degree and references one of his areas where he goofed things up. It says, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places, but for the sake of Staying on the positive side of things, I'll, I'll emphasize the first part of that verse because that brings me a lot of joy to read, and I'm certain that it would have brought David a lot of joy to read that Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. It's a beautiful statement. Now, here's the thing. You know, when I think about this from a father's perspective, it's not up to me what will be said about my children someday. That's not up to me, right? I, you know, I look at things and I'm like, all right, well, You do the best you can, you entrust your children over to the Lord, you pray for them lots, but in the end, it's not going to be up to me what's said about my children someday, but I'll tell you what, it'd sure bring my heart great joy if it could be said of them that they walked with the Lord and obeyed His commandments. And I'm praying that not just for my children, but I'm already thinking beyond that now. I'm thinking about my grandchildren. I'm thinking about my great-grandchildren. I'm thinking about generations I won't even meet this side of heaven. And I'm praying that very same thing for them because nothing would make me happier. And then when you think about the, the, the advice and the pep talk and the counsel that David gives, there's one other piece of counsel here that he gives to Solomon that I think is certainly worth noticing before we kind of see how he sums it all up. But he basically says, you know, if you're obedient to the Lord, your life will prosper. I I wonder, like, do we believe that? If we're obedient to the Lord, our life will prosper? You have David making a point to help Solomon understand that he would need the favor of God. He would need the blessing of, of God to truly succeed. If he wanted to prosper as a man and as a king, he needed to be careful not to harden his heart against God's leading. Now, good leaders, there's, there's something that I think could be said for good leaders. Good leaders know what it's like to be led. I think a good leader knows what it's like to be led. As they seek to be an authority, they need to first accept what it means to be under authority. I don't think that you can be a good authority until you've, you truly understand what it means to be someone who lives under authority. And uh, in the case of those who desire to, to understand the Lord's will, I think if that's us, if our hearts desire to understand the Lord's will, I think our hearts need to remain in a place of submission to His guidance. 
So people who maybe walk with some authority on this earth, but always recognize that we are under the Lord's authority in our life. Because if we, if, if we don't go about life in such a way where we submit ourselves ultimately to the Lord and His guidance, I think what's going to happen is that our eyes and our ears will not be attuned to receiving His counsel, we'll rely on our own wisdom, our own thinking, and worldly counsel, and we'll find ourselves in a spot that's unhealthy and unwell. And that's certainly not something that the Lord desires for you and for me as His children. And so you have David encouraging Solomon to understand, look, if you're obedient to the Lord, your life will prosper. If you harden your heart against the Lord, do not expect your life to prosper. And as David was speaking all these things to Solomon, you know, all sorts of things I'm sure are going through his mind at that time as he's as his life is winding down, I think he also had, and I'm certain he had this in mind, um, the fact that the Lord had made a very specific promise to him during the course of his life. Did you notice what David brought up when I read that initial grouping of verses from 1 Kings chapter 2? There's a promise David has in mind that he hasn't forgotten. There's something he's looking forward to that he expects to be fulfilled long after his days on this earth are completed. And you have David speaking of that promise to Solomon when he says this. Let me read it to us. It's in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4. David says, "...that the Lord may establish His word that He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. That's what David was being told. That's what, it's what was revealed to him earlier in his reign when he was a younger king. The Lord had promised David that even after his days on this earth were complete, that one of his sons would sit on the throne of Israel. That promise is actually given in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It says this, when you look at verses 12 and 13, David was told this, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's what David was told. Now, in one respect, I think it would seem logical to at least see a partial fulfillment of this promise in Solomon, who would now reign in David's place. But I think there's a deeper fulfillment of this promise that's given to us when we look at the totality of what Scripture conveys. In fact, there's a long-promised king that this prophetic word was ultimately pointing to, one whose reign would last longer than four or five decades like David and Solomon enjoyed a reign that would be established forever. The King is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And when you look at the totality of what Scripture is telling us, this is yet another one of those Scriptures that's giving us a hint of God's ultimate plan for humanity and for our rescue and redemption. And there are certain things that are said when you, when you get into the Gospels that are trying to show you that this particular prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus. And you see a couple of these things when you look in Matthew chapter 12. And in Matthew chapter 12, it gives us an account of something that takes place that's very miraculous. And it says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, him being Jesus, and Jesus healed him so that the man spoke and saw. So you have this man, he's oppressed by demons, he cannot see, he cannot speak, but miraculously Jesus heals him and now the man is able to do both. And people, as they're seeing this, the Scripture tells us, it says, and all the people were amazed, and what did they say? They said, can this be the son of David? Can it Maybe this guy. Maybe this guy is the son of David. And then, then Jesus, later in that chapter, makes a statement. He's speaking to this, to, to this group of people, and he's talking to them. Some are speculating, could this be the son of David? And then there are others that are like, can this guy just stop doing what he's doing? Stop with the miracles, stop with the teaching, stop drawing attention to yourself, etc. Right? And then Jesus says this, he says, look, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. That's what Jesus was saying. Something greater than Solomon is here. The people are like, hey, could this be 
the son of David. And Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm telling you right now, something greater than Solomon is here. During those days when Jesus was walking here on this earth, the people of, of, of Israel, they lived under occupation from the Roman government. And this was insulting to them. They resented it deeply. They felt like it was disrespectful. They didn't like some outside source or outside power calling the shots in their community and in their nation. They resented it. And they looked back to history when they felt like they had a place of prominence, and, um, and they missed it, and they really wanted to experience what life was like when David and Solomon were leading the nation instead of being under Roman occupation. But in the midst of that humiliating season, they were taking consolation in the fact that there were prophetic promises of God mentioned in Scripture that the day would come when the, the Lord would send the Messiah, the son of David, who would rule on the throne of Israel and who, who would lead the nation with benevolence once again. They were looking for a king like David or Solomon to lead them. But again, what did Jesus reveal to the hearts of those who had hearts of stone in the context in which he was teaching and to the hearts of those who had hearts of faith in the midst of that context? He, he made it clear to them that while they were looking for another Solomon, one who was greater than Solomon was right there in front of their faces. The Messiah they were waiting for was the very man they were conversing with, but sadly, many of them failed to actually realize this. And here's the thing. We're no different than that group of people that Jesus was ministering to in the midst of that season. Because many of us could admit, if we're really, really honest, that, that we have spent a lot of time looking for wisdom and looking for guidance from people on this earth who strike us as great leaders and great sages. We've done the same thing as that generation happened to do. We look for people like that to direct our lives and bring order to our chaos, to rule our governments and things like that. And yet it's Jesus, the one who is greater than all other leaders and all other influencers and all other kings, who stands before us and offers us hope through Him. That's what He does, just as He was doing in the midst of this generation. No one can light a candle to His wisdom, even Solomon. No one can compete for His authority, even David. Only Christ holds the rightful claim to the throne of our hearts. And so the question we have to wrestle with when we look at scriptures like this and look at the words that Jesus said during the course of His earthly ministry is, will we joyfully recognize Jesus as Lord? And if we do so, will we likewise joyfully submit our lives over to Him? Do I want to keep calling the shots or do I want to let Him call the shots? I uh, read something very interesting uh, very recently, it, it, it's from Dr. S. M. Lockridge, and it was quoted in the book um, "Jesus Knowing Our Savior." And um, and this is what he said. He said, "My King was born King." The Bible says he is the seven-way King. He is the King of the Jews. That is a racial King. He is King of Israel. That is a national King. He is a King of righteousness. He is a King of the ages. He's the King of heaven. He's the King of glory. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now that's my King. Then he went on and said this. He says, well, I wonder if you do know him. Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my King? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He goes on to also say, he's enduringly strong, he's enduringly sincere, he's eternally steadfast, he's immortally graceful, he's imperially powerful, he's impartially merciful, that's my king. He's God's son, he's a sinner's savior, he's the centerpiece of civilization, he stands alone in himself, he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest idea in philosophy. He's the fundamental truth in theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. That's my king. Now, I don't know what my final words will be. I hope I get to say something poetic. Probably not how it's going to work out, but maybe it will. I'll hold out hope, some optimism. But truthfully, I don't know what my final words are going to be. But whether I could speak in coherent sentences at the end of my life or if I'm not able to speak at all, 
What I do hope is that the prevailing testimony of my life will clearly testify to who Jesus is and why he's worthy of our worship and our devotion. He's the king that we're waiting for. He's the king that we need. He's the king that we can worship and serve right now. He's the king I'm placing my full trust in forever, and he offers himself to each of us. And he gives us the privilege to know him and to realize that he indeed is the very one that was prophetically being shared about with David, the one that David was looking forward to, the one that Solomon was looking forward to, the one that the people of Israel were looking forward to, even though many of them missed him when he was right there in their midst. And he's the one that our hearts, ultimately, I I think we know deep down we have a need that can only be satisfied by him, can't be satisfied by anyone or anything else. And in his grace, he offers himself to us. And we have the privilege to acknowledge him as the long-promised king, our Lord of Lords, our King of Kings, our Prince of Peace, the one who offers us salvation. And as David was encouraging Solomon to be a man who walked with the Lord and understood what it looked like to live that out in day-to-day life, I believe that that's a challenge that we're being given from Scripture as well. Know the Lord, not just about the Lord. Know the Lord personally and walk with Him joyfully. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be able to look at a portion of Scripture like this today and to think about the things that you've revealed to us in it. Lord, we're grateful for the things that that you inspired David to say to Solomon. And we're grateful that when we look in the the next chapter, the book of 1 Kings, we could see that it describes Solomon at that season of his life as someone who, who loved you, someone who lived in obedience to your commandments. Lord, we pray that that would be able to be said of us and our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren as well. We pray that there would be a legacy of genuine and sincere faith that runs like a string through our family history. Lord, I realize that for some of us, we are the first generation of believers in our families. And then some of us come from a great heritage and history of believers who pass down the faith to us. Lord, we know we have no control over what happened before us. And in many respects, we have to admit that we don't have any control over what happens after us either. But we do have some control over over how we carry ourselves in the midst of this world. And so, Lord, we pray that our words would speak the truth of your gospel and the proclamations of your word to, to our children and to anyone who would bother to listen to us. And we pray that our lives would testify to the fact that we are people who take seriously the privilege that you've given to us to walk with you. We don't want to just know data about you or trivia about you. We don't want to just have uh, some of this information stored away in a file cabinet in our mind. We want to be people who know you deeply and sincerely through your Son, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the one who fulfills the promise that you gave to your servant David. So, Lord, thank you so much for including us in your kingdom. Thank you for giving us the privilege to know you and to walk with you, and thank you for the fact that you even place within our hearts a desire to take these things seriously in the midst of a world that offers us all sorts of competing thoughts and ideas. Lord, we don't want to buy into the falsehoods and the silliness of this world. We don't want to fail to understand what it means to be a man of God or a woman of God. We want to understand what that looks like, and we want to actively live it out. So, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness, and thank you again for challenging us with your word today. We pray that we would take it seriously and that your name would be glorified in how we go about our day-to-day life. We pray that it would all be for your glory. We know that that's the reason for which you have created us. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.